Hello and welcome back. Continuing Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. You have your hands on thousands, you fools, and you hang a leg. You'd be as rich as kings if you could find it, and you know it's here, and you stand there skulking. There wasn't one of you dare face Bill, and I did it, a blind man. And I am to lose my chance for you? I am to be a poor, crawling beggar, sponging for rum, when I might be rolling in a coach? If you had the pluck of a weevil in a biscuit, you would catch them still. Hang it, Pew. We got the doubloons, grumbled one. They might have hid the blessed thing, said another. Take the Georges, Pew, and don't stand here squalling. Squalling was the word for it. Hugh's anger rose so high at these objections till at last, his passion completely taking the upper hand, he struck at them right and left in his blindness, and his stick sounded heavily on more than one. These in their turn cursed back at the blind miscreant, threatened him in horrid terms, and tried in vain to catch the stick and wrest it from his grasp. This quarrel was the saving of us. For while it was still ragging, another sound came from the top of the hill on the side of the hamlet, the tramp of horses galloping. Almost at the same time, a pistol shot, flash, and report came from the hedge side, and that was plainly the last signal of danger, for the buccaneers turned at once and ran, separating in every direction. One seaward along the cove, one slat across the hill, and so on, so that in a half minute not a sign of them remained but pew. Him they had deserted, whether in sheer panic or out of revenge for his ill words and blows I know not. But there he remained behind, tapping up and down the road in a frenzy and groping and calling for his comrades. Finally he took a wrong turn and ran a few steps past me, towards the hamlet, crying, Johnny, Black Dog, Dirk, and other names, you won't leave old pews, mates, not old pew. Just then the noise of horses topped the rise, and four or five riders came in sight in the moonlight and swept at full gallop down the slope. At this pew, saw his error, turned with a scream, and ran straight for the ditch into which he rode. But he was on his feet again in a second and made another dash, not utterly bewildered right under the nearest of the coming of horses. That the rider tried to save him, but in vain. Down went Pew with a cry that rang high into the night, and the four hoofs trampled and spun him and passed by. He fell on his side, then, then gently collapsed upon his face and moved no more. I leaped to my feet and hailed the riders. They were pulling up at any rate, horrified at the accident, and I soon saw what they were. One, tailing out behind the rest, was a lad that had gone from the hamlet to Dr. Livesey's. The rest were revenue officers whom he had met by the way and with whom he had had the intelligence to return at once. Some news of the lugger in Kitzhold had found its way to Supervisor Dance and set him forth that night in our direction and to that circumstance my mother and I owed our preservation from death. Pew was dead, stone dead. As for my mother, when we had carried her up to the hamlet, a little cold water and salts, and that soon brought her back again, and she was none the worse for her terror, though she still continued to deplore the balance of the money. In the meantime, the supervisor rode on as fast as he could to Kitzhoe, but his men had to dismount and grope down the dingo, leading and sometimes supporting their horses, and in continual fear of ambushes. So it was no greater matter for surprise that when they got down to the hole, the lugger was already under way, though still close in. He held her. A voice replied, telling him to keep out of the moonlight or he will get some lead in him. And at the same time, a bullet whistled close by his arm. Soon after, the lugger doubled the point and disappeared. Mr. Dan stood there, as he said, like a fish out of water. And all he could do was to dispatch a man to be to warn the cutter. And that, said he, 
is just as good is just about as good as nothing. They got off clean, and there's an end. Only, he added, I am glad I trod on Master Pew's corns, for by this time he had heard my story. I went back with him to the Admiral Benbow, and you cannot imagine a house in such a state of smash. The very clock had been thrown down by these fellows in their furious hunt after my mother and myself and though nothing had actually been taken away except the captain's money bag and a little silver from the till, I could see at once that we were ruined. Mr. Dans could make nothing of the scene. They got the money, you say? Well then, Hawkins, what in fortune were they after? More money, I suppose? No, sir, not money, I think, I replied I. In fact, sir, I believe I have the thing in my breast pocket, and to tell you the truth, I should like to get it put in safety. To be sure, boy, quite right, said he. I'll take it, if you like. I thought perhaps, Dr. Livesey, I began. Perfectly right, he interrupted very cheerfully. Perfectly right, a gentleman and a magistrate. And now I come to think of it, I might as well ride around there myself and report to him or squire. Master Pew's dead, when all's done. Not that I regret it, but he's dead, you see and people will make it out against an officer of His Majesty's revenue, if make it out they can. Now, I'll tell you, Hawkins, if you like, I'll take you along. I thanked them heartily for the offer, and we walked back to the hamlet, where the horses were. By the time I had told Mother of my purpose, they were all in the saddle. Dogger, said Mr. Dant, you have a good horse. Take up this lad behind you. As soon as I was mounted, holding on to Dogger's belt, the supervisor gave the word, and the party struck out at a bouncing trot on the road to Dr. Livesey's house. Chapter 6 The Captain's Papers We rode hard all the way till we drew up before Dr. Livesey's door. The house was all dark to the front. Mr. Dance told me to jump down and knock, and Dogger gave me a stirrup to descend by. The door was open almost at once by the maid. Is Dr. Livy seen in? I asked. No, said she. She had come home in the afternoon, but had gone up to the hall to dine and pass the evening with the squire. So there we go, boy, said Mr. Dance. This time, at the distance, was short. I did not mount, but ran with Dogger Stare Leather to the lodge gates and up the long, leafless, moonlit avenue to where the white line of the hall building looked on either hand on great old gardens. Here Mr. Dance dismounted, and taking me along with him, was admitted at a word into the house. The servant led us down a matted passage and showed us at the end into a great library, all lined with bookcases and busts upon the top of them, where the squire and Dr. Livy see, sat, pipe in hand, on either side of a bright fire. I had never seen the squire so near at hand. He was a tall man, over six feet high and broad in proportion, and he had a bluff, rough and ready face, all roughened and reddened and lined in his long travels. His eyebrows were very black and moved readily, and this gave him a look of some temper, not bad, you would say, but quick and high. Come in, Mr. Dance, said he, very stately and con condescending. Good evening, Dan, said the doctor with a nod, and good evening to you, friend Jim. What good wind brings you here? The supervisor stood up straight and stiff and told his story like a lesson, and you should have seen how the two gentlemen leaned forward and looked at each other and forgot to smoke in their surprise and interest. When they heard how my mother went back to the inn, Dr. Lee fairly slapped his thigh, and the squire cried, Bravo! and broke his long pipe against the grate, long before it was done. Mr. Trelawney, that you will remember was the squire's name, had got up from his seat and was striding about the room, and the doctor, as if to hear the better, had taken off his powdered wig and sat there looking very strange indeed with his own close cropped black pole. At last, Mr. Dance finished the story. So I'm going to leave it off there, and thank you for listening. If you have any comments? Please comment there, and I'm going to continue the story. See you next video. Bye.